live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. I'm Kaylee Wines. And I'm Shanali Basic stepping in for Matt Miller. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, countdown to the merge. After years of testing, development, and delays, Ethereum's ambitious software upgrade is finally upon us. We'll speak with Ethereum co-founder Joe Lubin. And for all the hype around the merge, another inflation shock is dragging on crypto assets. Arca's Katie Talati helps us navigate that volatility. And crypto also taking the spotlight on Capitol Hill. The latest on the debate between lawmakers and executives on the regulatory framework for digital assets. So all of that is ahead, but first let's get a snapshot of the market because it is brutal out there after that upside surprise on CPI data here in the U.S. this morning. It is taking stocks down hard. The S&P is down 3%. The tech-heavy NASDAQ 100 down more than 4%. And as we know, there's a very tight correlation between tech stocks and the performance of cryptocurrencies. So perhaps no surprise you're seeing crypto assets drag down even harder. Bitcoin is down 2.4%. We're trading right now south of $20,800. And Ether also down the better part of 7%, right now trading just under 1610. So it goes to show you that that inflation fear, the concern about tightening from the Federal Reserve is really just outweighing any optimism about the merge at this point. But optimism there is. Crypto enthusiasts and critics too have been weighing in on the potential risks and rewards of Ethereum software upgrade. Take a listen. The merge is really coming. It's a very complex system and uh, uh, the pieces uh, are nearly uh, fully in place. The Ethereum merge is a really big story. It's finally here, and that gives energy to the space. Going proof of stake is a huge step for Ethereum. I think it just makes the network much more secure. It is using less energy and much ready to be much more scalable. There will not be more any more mining. Um, Ethereum's uh, energy consumption will go down, so it'll go from being a big problem to basically not a problem at all. We've been you know, much more excited about Ethereum in the last Last month or two uh, than Bitcoin. I'm personally um, really in love with Ethereum. I don't necessarily think uh, move to proof of stake is a great thing for Ethereum in the short run. What I care about is that the merge is successful and that this upgrade does not have a technical glitch, that the edge cases and bugs have been worked out. That is what's important here. Ethereum has been promising proof of stake since basically they started. Wake me up when the transition happens. Now let's get you a quick done rundown of exactly what the merge is, because for a long time and with Bitcoin and Ethereum, computing power has been used to solve complex problems to validate tra transactions on a blockchain. But the Ethereum network here is changing with the hope that crypto can move away from those miners toward a community of validators to unlock puzzles and draw consensus on a blockchain by putting more assets at stake. As Ethereum.org puts it, miners prove they have assets at stake by putting up energy. But but in proof of stake, validators stake capital or their own ether and with the hope that this will secure the network with more nodes and create a lower barrier to entry. And because of the lack of reliance on mining, a hope that energy use will also be more efficient, potentially cutting Ethereum's energy use by 99 percent. But there are misconceptions, according to the organization, and there's no promise that gas fees or costs tied to transactions will be lower or that those transactions will be faster. The chain will also not have downtime associated with the merge, but there are some exchanges that are limiting withdrawals and deposits out of certain fears. Now, those fears include potential scammers or developers who try to create chains or forks that look like Ethereum that attract customer funds. But exchanges are also concerned about layer two trains, uh, chains and projects that are tied to Ethereum that could be impacted from the changes seen in the system. Then there's simply the great unknown, and that's any glitches that can come with a complicated upgrade, despite those years of anticipation and testing, Kaylee. Years it has been, Shanali, and someone has been working for years on this as well. Joe Lubin, co-founder of Ethereum and founder of Consensus, a global blockchain company, is joining us now. Joe, what a day to have you. What a week it seems that it is going to be. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being extremely nervous and 10 being highly confident, how are you feeling right now about the merge? Um, I am 10. Uh, highly confident. Uh, we think it's going to be probably nothing, and probably nothing is a, a playful phrase in our ecosystem uh, that indicates uh, um, a bit sarcastically that uh, we think it'll be enormously impactful, but it'll also be um, very likely nothing in the sense that uh, there's no disruption uh, that's going to 
be experienced by end users. Uh, there's virtually no disruption uh, that's being experienced by software developers. It'll be as smooth as if your iPhone or, or your laptop uh, has upgraded its operating system automatically overnight. Okay. Um, in terms of impact uh, in the history of our ecosystem, there have been two major events so far, uh, the advent of Bitcoin and the development of Ethereum, a much more programmable and expressive blockchain technology. Um, mm -hmm. This slots in as number three, in my opinion. Well, Joe, you're kind of painting a picture of smooth sailing. No one's going to notice. It's going to be seamless. Yet this also isn't necessarily real world proven yet. What is your biggest concern about things that potentially could go wrong? Uh, tiny little concerns. Um, uh, there's been so much testing uh, that the merge itself is overwhelmingly likely uh, to be very smooth, um, but we haven't tested it in the context of, of uh, the whole big ecosystem, which is becoming a, an economy in its own right. And so there are lots of little projects that uh, maybe um, uh, read from the blockchain or depend on it in some ways. It's possible that some of those little projects haven't uh, um, upgraded what they need to upgrade in order for uh, their own smooth transition, but all the major services mm -hmm. that depend on the blockchain uh, um, have already done the work. I think that's a good question. We've been talking a little about those concerns that maybe some of the exchange has, exchanges have and the reason perhaps that they are pausing withdrawals and deposits, including being layer twos and how they interact with Ethereum after the merge. Are there changes that need to be made for any projects that are tied to Ethereum that may need to also make changes to really react to this merge? Yeah, well, as many have said, we've been telegraphing this for, for many years uh, and telegraphing it uh, very explicitly um, for uh, many months. Uh, and so, as I said, uh, all major exchanges, all major infrastructure uh, have done the work. And, mm -hmm. and so there, there's nothing to be concerned about. So you mentioned um, the ecosystem around it too, Joe. I mean, how, what is your expectation here about how the economics change when you move to proof of stake? Is there a sense of how much people are going to stake kind of in the initial months of the merge and what that will mean for what Ethereum is worth? Well, there's already uh, an enormous amount of Ether staked uh, in the beacon chain. The merge is essentially moving the consensus chain and the execution chain together into a, a single system. So there's already a huge amount of Ether staked. And we anticipate that uh, with the reduction in this uh, overhanging uncertainty, um, once the merge is complete, that uh, many more uh, actors, including um, institutions, financial institutions, will um, take that as a, a go sign that the coast is clear and, and that they can uh, treat Ether, uh, a yielding asset, uh, as something that they uh, want to participate in uh, as a, a decorrelated or uncorrelated asset and an infrastructure that they um, mm already consider uh, potentially systemically important in the future and need to gain expertise in. And so we're, we're yeah. we've spoken to many financial institutions that are, are ready to, to dive in. Well, Joe, you talk about the future, and of course, this is a major upgrade, no doubt, but it also, the idea, sets the stage for further upgrades down the road, upgrades that could do things like improve transaction speeds. Do you have a timeline as to what upgrade is going to come next and when? Yeah, so um, the amount of Ether that will be issued by the protocol will be reduced by about 90%. Uh, and further, it won't actually be movable off the consensus chain for a while. We, uh, we implemented a minimum viable merge fork uh, so that we could just ensure that we get everything right. Uh, and so we've delayed some other pieces to subsequent forks. And so it'll be a bunch of months before any of the newly issued Ether um, is able to to leave uh, the addresses that, uh, that it'll be in. And so that's going to be very interesting um, for supply demand dynamics, where the supply is, uh, of new Ether is essentially zero for quite mm -hmm. a while. Um, the next major upgrade will add uh, what's called data availability, guaranteed data availability shards. Um, and so we've seen mm -hmm. the Ethereum network 
uh, split up into a security module, an execution module, and soon a data avail availability module. The right. execution module has already brought tremendous scalability in the form of these layer two rollups that run transactions above the chain, but uh, with the full security guarantee of the security layer. And then adding this third module, um, data availability will enable these layer two rollups to be bigger, faster, and more plentiful. Yeah. Joe, I, I, we only have about a minute left here. I'm really curious here about staking and some of the dynamics here. Do you fear that staking as a business, as you see Coinbase doing more of, and as you'd like to see more financial institutions do to encourage more staking to build this network, do you think it can come under scrutiny from regulators who fear that this is a yield generating product, that this is uh, could cause some liquidity mismatches as we've seen in some other yield products in the crypto space? Yeah, well, it is under scrutiny by regulators. Uh, everything we do is under scrutiny by regulators. And uh, um, since the start of uh, the advent of our ecosystem, we've been progressively decentralizing what we do. Uh, we didn't couldn't start out uh, massively decentralized, and that is the goal. Uh, and every time that uh, hackers or um, attackers uh, within the rules uh, in our ecosystem to try to exploit certain systems for monetary gain uh, or regulators identify weaknesses and some of those weaknesses are in the form of centralization uh, in our technology. We, we take that as a, a teaching signal and that's where we focus next on, on making things uh, um, rigorously, maximally decentralized. And so uh, okay. we, we already have uh, a lot of work underway uh, to decentralize uh, every aspect of, of the staking ecosystem. Joe, just want to squeeze this in quickly. So one word answer. When do you think the flippening might happen? Soon. All right, Joe Lubin, co-founder of Ethereum. Thank you so very much for joining us. Great to get your insight on this week of the merge. Now, I just want to quickly bring some breaking news. Twitter shareholders have approved Elon Musk's $44 billion takeover of the company. Of course, a takeover that Elon Musk is trying to get out of. Twitter rejected his desire to get out of it three separate times. There is a court case that will take place in Delaware next month. But Twitter shares not reacting too much to the news right now, positive by about 1%. Again, Twitter shareholders approving Musk's $44 billion takeover bid for the company. But coming up, we'll keep an eye on crypto instead. More on the merge and what it means for crypto markets with Katie Toledi, Director of Research at Arca. And the Senate panel is set to review a bill about cryptocurrencies. More on what that means for regulation ahead. And to access all of the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. like the iPhone, when the iPhone first came out, you looked at the iPhone and you said, oh, this is pretty cool. I've got GPS, I got yeah, a flashlight, yeah. right? Now, and then, but, but what Apple understood is they were unlocking this capability that anybody creative could create applications. Ethereum is just a platform for businesses to be built on. That's Jenny Johnson. She's the CEO of Franklin Templeton Investments speaking with Bloomberg yesterday. And for more on Ethereum and its long -apated, uh, and its uh, long anticipated software challenge, we're joined now by Katie Talati. She's the director of research at Arca, a digital asset manager. You know, Katie, there's so many questions about the competitive positioning about Ethereum into this merge. And uh, Kaylee had just left off with Joe Lubin about when the flippening might happening happen if, if it happens. How do you feel that it really competes with Bitcoin? in a new era of Ethereum? I don't really know if we can necessarily compare Bitcoin and Ethereum like head to head. I mean, Bitcoin at the end of the day has a very different purpose than Ethereum. Um, kind of as, uh, you know, that soundbite you played it said, you know, Ethereum is really like the Apple App Store for apps in a decentralized world. Um, Bitcoin has mostly been a, you know, peer-to-peer -peer payments system as it was initially designed to be. It does have the ability for applications to be built on on top of it and have smart contract capabilities similar to Ethereum. However, um, you know, the developers and the community have not chosen to go down that path just yet. So it's kind of remained uh, just this very basic value transfer system. Mm. Um, um, you know, that said, I think that, you know, both have their own place in kind of like the future financial world that we live in. 
What about specific Ethereum rivals? It's one thing, Ethereum versus Bitcoin, but what about Solana, Polkadot, Avalanche? How could this ultimately position those against Ethereum? There's so many. It's interesting. Like I, I've been in uh, in the space for about four years, and in that time, I've seen so many kind of layer one is what they're called competitors come out against Ethereum, either trying to offer um, a better smart contract platform experience, faster speeds, like tighter transactions, um, and they've all used different um, kind of. Uh, scaling solutions that have been, you know, talked about for the Ethereum roadmap. I think uh, Joe Lubin just discussed with you, like sharding that's going to be implemented mm -hmm. next. Like, that's already used across some of the different L1s. Um, you know, I think that some of them have made a good um, go at trying to kind of capture the market share from Ethereum. But at the end of the day, Ethereum was first. It's been around the longest. And as a result, it's got kind of the smartest minds in the space working on it. And so yeah. it's going to be very hard to catch up to their lead. And when we think about the merge specifically, what do you think it ultimately could mean for institutional adoption? I mean, I think it's a really, you know, great path forward. I think that depending on kind of how institutions are investing, it definitely helps the investment case for them. Um, I know in some cases, um, you know, the ESG narrative has definitely been, um, you know, a hurdle. So the fact that, you know, we're going from proof of work to proof of stake, we're reducing energy consumption on Ethereum by 99.5%, according to the Ethereum Foundation. And that's, you know, that's one huge piece. Um, another piece too, is that you now have like a productive asset. So whereby in the past, like, yes, you could hold your Ethereum, yes, you could use it, but if you're an institution, now you can stake it and you can mm -hmm. earn built on it and that is i think definitely going to be a turning point for the tech, yeah the technology here katie is so so interesting but we are also talking about this on a day where the s p is down more than three percent and the nasdaq is also down significantly and and more than the s p and we've seen that correlation with the nasdaq all year play out so how do you think about cryptocurrencies particularly ethereum that is going through this pivotal moment in the middle of a really challenging macro backdrop yeah, I mean, the macro environment has definitely been unfortunate. Like, risk assets don't perform well in this type of environment. And right now, crypto is considered a risk asset. Um, the correlation is very high to the S&P. Um, and, you know, I think that just the overall environment is very overshadowed by inflation. Um, you know, the CPI print came in way, you know, above what people were expecting. And I think that was a bit of a, you know, shock to the market. There were also some people, you know, buying VIX calls, like all this stuff really contributed to kind of what we're seeing this morning. Um, I don't think though that um, Ethereum's kind of current price is reflective of what is happening with the merge. I also don't think that, you know, if anybody's hoping to see a run up of price into the merge, I don't think that's the right way to look at this event. Um, I look at this similar to kind of the Bitcoin halving when Bitcoin supply uh, gets cut in half. It's you know something everyone's going to watch until the day it happens, and then six months later, you're going to actually feel it in the price movement. And uh, finally, Katie, of course, the reason why risk assets are down so hard today is because of hot inflation. Yet there is also a deflationary impact when we think about the merge. How are you viewing that? I'm feeling it as super bullish. I mean, uh, I, I think again, I think Joe Lubin just talked about this, but you know, we're going from having about. Um, 15, or we're, we're going from, you know, 15,000, I think, or 16,000 Ethereum emitted per day to more like 1,500 around emitted per day, depending on the number of people staking. And then on top of that, nobody's going to actually be able to withdraw any Ethereum from the staking chain for anywhere from six to 12 months. So you're essentially going to have no new emission on Ethereum, um, whereby before you had miners who were emitting um, that's Bitcoin, you know, or sorry, emitting their Ethereum and then maybe having to sell it depending on kind of like their cost structures. And now you've basically got like completely locked up asset for anywhere from six to 12 months. All right, we have to leave it there, but Katie Talati, Director of Research at ARCA, Thank you so much. Now, we talked about how inflation is taking its toll on crypto assets today. So let's get a quick check on the wider markets because it is ugly out there. After CPI came in hot, you now have solidified expectations of a 75 basis point move from the Federal Reserve this month. Maybe some even betting on 100. And as a result, the Nasdaq 100 is down four percentage points on the day as we see yields moving higher, specifically at the short end. That two-year yield up more than 19 basis points right now, trading at 376. The dollar is stronger on the day. And of course, all of that a negative feedback loop into cryptocurrencies with Bitcoin down 7% trading at $20,790. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lines with Shanali Basik. Matt Miller is off today. Now to some crypto stories that caught our attention this week. And a new crypto exchange backed by the likes of Citadel and Charles Schwab is set to launch. EDX markets will start trading a limited number of spot crypto tokens starting with a November trial period and an official launch in January. The goal is to allow investors to buy and sell digital assets through their existing broker dealer rather than an outside venue or directly through a crypto native exchange. And the venture capital unit of Sam Bankman Fried's FTX is taking a 30% stake in Anthony Scaramucci's Skybridge Capital. A portion of the new capital is used to buy 40 million worth of cryptocurrencies as a balance sheet investment. Now, Sam Bankman Fried said in a statement that Skybridge will also help FTX expand into non crypto related investments. And a Senate panel is holding a hearing on crypto regulation this Thursday. CFTC Chairman Rustin Benheim and Coinbase executive are expected to appear. A bill would give the CFTC sweeping new powers to oversee cryptocurrencies. Research from Bloomberg Intelligence expects clarity from Congress within the next year on stable coins and on whether a token is a security or a commodity. And Shanali, we know from speaking with players in crypto themselves, they want to see the CFTC as their regulator. They do not want the SEC. It's amazing. Can you watch an industry choose here for a minute? I think it's a lot because you've seen a lot of the SEC come through with enforcement this year and a lot of lack of clarity on what is a security, what is not a security, how does tokenization fit in when you're looking at assets across the industry. Uh, it'll be interesting to finally see lawmakers decide. I think it'll be a template. Kaylee, for what other industries may do as they watch law start to guide what the agencies actually do, which we know is a big theme that we're seeing across. Yeah, and, and we know there's a bit of a turf war as well. And yes. Gary Gensler, to your point, was talking about those securities rules just last week, the SEC chairman, and he also will be on Capitol Hill this week. He's going to be testifying on the 15th, so on Thursday, uh, in a Senate banking committee hearing. So. It'll be interesting to see what kind of catalyst, if yeah. any, it is for the market, because you know they're going to be gripped onto every single thing he and the lawmakers have to say. It's interesting to see how much actual time so many of these executives are spending in Washington. You yeah. see Sam Bankman-Fried there, both on the regulatory front and on the political contributions front. But when you're thinking about this at the end, you know, a lot of clarity could go a long way for this industry. And clarity is something they've been wanting for a long, long time. Shanali, thank you so much for joining me today. It was awesome to have you with me. And come back to Bloomberg Crypto next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Avalab's President John Wu will be joining us. That is next week, but the market coverage continues here on Bloomberg TV as we have a down day for risk assets. The Nasdaq 100 down 3.9%, the two-year yield up 18 basis points after hot inflation data. This is Bloomberg.